guys, welcome to another episode of Tin for the Producers, Texas edition. Yeah! Nice. Um, yeah, so welcome to uh, another special episode. We would like to thank subscribers, first of all, uh, for making this video content like this possible. We wouldn't be here uh, making this video if it weren't for you guys, so thanks for that. Uh, I'm Jake Ross, by the way, associate producer of the Persistent Universe. I am Jason Hutchins, senior producer for Star Citizen. And uh, we're here to answer some questions from the forums. Uh, we got 10 questions here that we've kind of gone through, thanks to those of you who, who uh, submitted questions. We could only get through 10 of them, so apologies in advance. But um, yeah, with that, Jason, you want to ask? I will take it away. Take it away. All right, our first question is from Graxis. Uh, with so many gameplay mechanics and system content needing to be developed for the persistent universe, how do you make prioritization decisions on what is developed first? Yeah, I'd say uh, first and foremost, the priorities come from Chris and Tony. Like uh, those are the guys directing the project, so uh, you know they they kind of pave the way for how we're supposed to, to prioritize our features. So that they decide, okay, we have an upcoming release. What do we want to show? Um, and then once they decide on what we want to show, we'll uh, break those features down into critical priority, high priority, and moderate priority. Um, and what that really means is that the critical feature is something that is an absolute must-have for that release. Um, a high, high priority uh, feature is, an, is a nice to have. It's something that's not essential, but it's, it's, it's something that we'd like to have in the release. And then a moderate is a wish list item. So it's something that if we get to it, great. If not, no sweat. Um, and it's f so, for example, we have, um, you know, for the first social module release, we had Art Corp. The environment itself was a um, very critical must have feature. So, it, you know, without Art Corp there, you wouldn't have had an environment to run around with, uh, run around in. So, it had to be there. Um, so, that's, our, that's a critical feature. We also had uh, emote text descriptions that was like a high feature. We wanted um, everyone to know kind of when you did your emotes. Uh, what was happening um, as you did them so that the text would show up in the chat chat, chat box. But uh, So that was a nice to have. Um, and then moderate would be the critical, or uh, it, the uh, moderate would be the chat. Opposite of critical. Yeah, oh so critical. <laughs> uh, moderate would be the chat, additional extraneous chat features like the ability to mi minimize windows and uh, customize chat just a little bit and uh, that didn't end up making it in. But you There's know, stuff it, that we yeah. want to do eventually, but we don't need to do right this second for yeah, this release. Yeah. Exactly. And and then those features that don't make it into that release, they'll either waterfall into the next release, sometimes at higher priority, sometimes at not uh, not higher priority, depending on what Tony and Chris want uh, to focus on, um, or they'll go into a backlog for later review. Yeah. So. A little peek behind the curtain too. We're trying to standardize what we're doing on the production side. Uh, as far as using the same kind of nomenclature for features that we do even for bugs, right? So we've got critical bugs, high priority bugs, and moderate bugs, right? Like, if it's a critical bug, we're not, we're not going to ship a patch with it. Yeah. Just like if it's a critical feature or as that, how that relates to task, we're not going to ship the patch with the patch without that being done. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's a focus shift to kind of prioritize features here going forward that are needed for both Persistent Universe and Squadron 42 and Star Citizen as a whole. So we're trying to look at it uh, kind of holistically rather than kind of being split up across various modules. Yeah. Cool. All right, uh, next question is from Foible. Chris Roberts has stated that his, it is his intention that after the PU launches, his vision is to see a continued rollout of content as long as there is interest in the game. Mm -hmm. He sees these releases to be as frequent as a few times per week. Do you envision these releases to be a progression of the story arc or just a technical expansion of the universe? In other words, will there be a progressive story arc that will unravel with time in the PU? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, the Persistent Universe is first and foremost an, an open world style of first person universe. Uh, and it's a sandbox, really. Um, there will be story, yes, uh, but it's the same kind of story that you have for settings, like world settings, right? Um, rather than a story arc. Missions will have stories. Characters that you run into will have stories. Um, but for big, sweeping story arcs, though, you'll get those in Squadron 42. Uh, and the Persistent Universe will support and kind of live around that story. And that uh, dovetails nicely with the next question. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a nice segue into this question from Nahima Darkstar. Will there be a storyline in Star Marine to be a little like Squadron 42 with some rendered cutscenes? Or is Star Marine just a first person shooter like Unreal Tournament, Quake Wars, etc.? Uh, will there be some FPS in Squadron 42 uh, or maybe in the next part of the single player game? Uh, yeah, so there will be FPS in Squadron 42. Um, 
the thing I want to talk about here, though, is Star Marine is a simulation within the first-person universe, right? Uh, much like Arena Commander is a simulation within the first-person universe, right? It's, it's a game within the game. Now, Star Marine is going to be a test bed for new features, for new game types, for new mission objectives and maps, right? Uh, we even plan on rolling out a way to do white box testing of environments that we expect to use in the Persistence of the Universe, uh, or even a part of a level for Squadron 42. Um, perhaps maybe we'll even roll out like new AI enemy behavior for uh, certain uh, monsters or other, other, um, other NPCs out there that uh, we can test within that environment, right, and get that working right and tweaked, get feedback from backers, and then put, get that into the game itself, the game proper, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the other question is like, will there be a story? And, and yes, some modes will have a story. Uh, and again, it's like it's the setting rather than a story, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like pirates are attacking the station, fight them off, right? That's a story, but it's not a big story, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So again, it's it's not a story like you like you'd see in Squadron Forty Two. That's where the big the big story arcs are going to come from. Yeah, and Star Marine is also used for like actually, you know, if you, if you're like Arena Commander is a simulation for practicing your dogfighting skills. Yeah, it's a simulation to practice your first person shooter skills if you don't want to jump right into the game. Uh, yeah, not full gung ho with a weapon. And so. not only that, not not only your first person shooter skills, but just your first person maneuvering skills, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like it's a safe place to learn kind of how the character interacts with the environment. Mm -hmm. So I got a question from Mr. Nowak. It starts out with, cheers to the PU team. Thanks. Yay. With the recent ongoing restructuring of the company, what has been the most challenging aspect that this has brought to your work as producers? How do you cope with organizational change when you have a system in the workplace? Yeah, I'd say, um you know, the most challenging part of any kind of restructure is just keeping team morale up, right? So you, nobody, nobody likes to see friends uh, leave the company or move to other parts of the project or, um, you know, other, uh, you know, they like to kind of keep the status quo, so to speak. And sometimes when that shifts, um, you know, there's team morale kind of takes a hit. So part of the job as of a, of a producer is uh, kind of the, the mama bear factor that you like to call it. So it's, it's that support and encouragement that a producer can prov provide. And, and uh, you know, when team morale is high, productivity is high. And so it's really crucial to our, our, our job to, to make sure that that happens. And, uh, you know, communicating um, what the new structure is to the entire uh, team, uh, making sure that there are no questions, and if there are questions, make ourselves available uh, for those for those developers who have questions about the new structure. Um, you know, just being just being aware of, of kind of the the feel of the team and, and, and interacting with them whenever we need to, to kind of um, update them on everything that's going on. So yeah, yeah. Jake and I we're also uh, kind of adjusting our roles here, so mm -hmm. there's a bit of a learning curve that we're in the middle of. So really. Ask us again once we know what the new normal is. Yeah. The normal's always shifting. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is from Amontillado. Assuming it's kind of that. Amontillado. Might, it might be no. Amontillado. Amontillado? The two yeah. L's throw me off. Um, mm -hmm. What's one of the m accomplishments that your team has achieved thus far that you're most proud of, Jake? Um, I, you know, it's a tough one. There's a couple things that stand out, namely the just the social module release in general. The first release was just a huge um, kind of success story for our team. Uh, you know, it was one of the one of, if not the only, Star Citizen release to actually hit the the deadline that we set out to hit. And um, you know, partnership with Behavior and Austin was uh, has been really great so far, and and that I think has shown with the release of Art Corp. Um, you know, the community can now see evidence of of that partnership and, and the, um, the our corporate environment is just amazing. It's it's really you know beautiful to look at, even though it's supposed to be the super grungy environment. Um, you know, it went through several design iterations over the over the past um, you know I don't even how, I don't even know how long, but it, it, they've, been, they've been working on it for a while. So <laughs> um, you know, we tried to get it just right to, to suit what our gameplay needs were, and uh, as those gameplay needs evolved, we had to switch some things up. So uh, Tony and Mark Skelton went back and forth with behavior uh, to make sure that all of those. Um, needs were taken care of and iterating and polishing and that kind of thing. So uh, the emotes were a fun addition as well, you know, getting to see, um, you know, some of our animators here in Austin actually captured a lot of those uh, of those emotes with motion capture. And um, so seeing them work on those, get those in the game with the uh, tag teaming with the designers and, and stuff. So um, yeah, it was, it was cool to see those in the community's hands as well. Yeah. You know, we've done so much in the past year uh, since I've been here 
uh, that it's hard to choose just one. So I'm not going to answer this. This is a Rosemary's <laughs> Baby question, and I'll, I'll have no part of it. <laughs> um, righty then. Next question from Drew Skyfer. Drew, Drewcifer. I hope it's Drewcifer. Yeah, I think it's Drewcifer. You're right. Yeah. Uh, how much time is spent on average by individual functional personnel, non-producers, project managers, providing content for all these regular updates that we give the community? Yeah. How do you all prevent status reports from interfering with personnel doing their jobs? Most of the status content we're seeing looks like it takes a while to put together and that it sh would really get in the way of actually creating the universe. As such, when I stop seeing something like Around the Versus ship shape during a given week or several weeks straight, I'm assuming the personnel are refocusing on actually getting the ships out. Uh, is this accurate or are those folks just on vacation? So uh, your assumption is correct, uh, Drusifer. They all go on vacation until the camera rolls, really. Um, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't. Um, they, they do, in fact, get back to work on their respective pipelines, right? Um, it certainly can be a big distraction. Uh, not that we don't love spending a lot of time with Thomas here uh, or, or writing letters for the community. Um, it, it's an important thing, though. So the community updates that we do, we're, they're written kind of as a partnership between the senior production staff, uh, the developer leads that, that they work with closely, and the community team, right? So um, the senior producers are in a position to have kind of a big picture view of the project. Uh, which makes them uniquely suited to kind of be able to write this kind of report, right? Um, one mantra of production is protect your team, right? And that's protect your team from distractions, protect your th team from things that keep them from doing their job, right? Um, uh, so a, a good producer will take this to heart and kind of keep the impact of these kind of reports to a minimum. Um, try to keep it to no more than a few minutes per developer per week, right, on these, on these kind of reports. Uh, it's the collating of the report and the gathering of the necessary materials, right, and the writing it down and editing it that really that takes the time. Like I personally have spent, the worst was probably a, like a day and a half total spread out over a few days, um, like writing some of the bigger Star Marine reports that I was working on. Um, but I would say that the average time for me has worked out to less than four hours a week, right? Mm -hmm. That's a chunk of time. Um, but you know, if I work yeah. a forty-hour week, which would be awesome, uh, <laughs> you know, it's less than ten percent of my time. Um, so I'd say that the average the average time is is not that great. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's an important for a producer to know kind of what his team is working, his or her team is working on uh, at any given point, right? So yeah. like. You know, our, we have weekly scrums here, we have leads meetings, we have just the day-to-day -day interaction with developers. At any point, like, I know what my team is working on at any given time. So, you know, making these reports, um, like, I know you do those, the Star Marine reports and stuff, and I'll, I'll chip in on the monthly report that you guys see, but uh, with any of these reports, it's like, um, it's, it's, uh, with any of these reports, it, it's easy for the producer to, to kind of take that information from his head and put it on, on paper because it, he already just kind of knows what his team is working on. Uh, yeah. In some instances, it's not, it's not the case. You have to actually reach out and get detailed updates for, the, um, for things that you don't have the information on. But yeah. for the most part, you should be able to kind of pull a lot of that information from your head already. So yeah. the important thing is to keep, like you said, protect your team from that time. And a lot of a way, to, a good way to do that is, is just to pull it from your own head. So Yeah, sure. Um, I should point out though that like we're we're not doing the Star Marine reports anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we're our focus has shifted so that it's it's specifically kind of a report on the progress of 2.0, mm -hmm. uh, and it, ultimately that'll be a report on the the progress of our Star Citizen releases in general, right? So um, I've been partnering with Tom Johnson mm -hmm. uh, in the in Manchester uh, on those reports mm -hmm. now, so we're kind of splitting the burden, which makes it a little both easier and harder for both of us, right? <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was that like developers like uh, Zane Bien working on the uh, user interface or Mark Avent who does the, you know, the, the bug smasher, um, those guys obviously spend more time, right? But I think uh, those are important updates, right? The, the communication with, with our backers, with you guys, um, and getting that feedback from the community really kind of keeps the team going and allows us to make course corrections where we need to, which uh, it's it's great and it's and it's almost a unique situation kind of in the industry. Um, yep. We should go to the next question. Yeah. Um, this next question is for Do from Doc. What's up, Doc? <laughs> How do you even keep track of all the small things up to the big? Uh, for example, the sheer size and difference of such things like 
Uh, one, creating modular assets of new designs that can be used for new systems, stations, landing points. Uh, two, bug fixing and adding important content to R Corp. Uh, another example is a subsumption update for uh, AI behavior, net code, buggies. Uh, and three, all of the as yet secret economy systems, simulations, uh, deep designs, et cetera, for all the far away multi system persistent universe. Mm. Um, ooh, that had an intero bang on it. That, that's <laughs> important. Uh, do you prioritize all of those things on a daily or weekly basis? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of requests that come in from Chris and Tony for all kinds of things. And, and uh, you know, I know, uh, speaking for Tony, Tony's general philosophy has told me several times is that he only really has a 12 month horizon, meaning that uh, he only really cares at any given moment about what's, what's on the horizon for the next 12 months, what's on the schedule for that time. Um, it makes things a little easier to manage on my side since the amount of content in the game uh, planned right now takes us well beyond uh, 12 months uh, yeah, from now. So. Um, you know, things that don't fall in the next 12 months, they usually fall into a backlog for later review. So we're not like, things aren't falling through the cracks or anything. We, have, we document everything and make sure it goes in a backlog. But, um, you know, that backlog grows and grows and grows. But 12 months, um, you know, just kind of every time something gets finished or completed, we pull something else out. And, and, you know, that's kind of how a back, backlog works. Yeah. Um, and there's never a shortage of good ideas. No, never. <laughs> and a lot of those good ideas come from the community. So thanks. That's great. Um, as far as keeping track of all the features uh, in the next 12 months um, goes, usually it's a matter of just pulling features from the backlog, producers gathering estimates and dependencies on the, uh, for those features uh, from the leads. It's a lot of times it's a, it's a relationship between the producer and the lead, um, talking about a feature, figuring out, okay, what's required, how do we break this down into individual tasks. Uh, and then taking those, those tasks and documenting them in our, in our um, software, uh, uh, task tracking software. Uh, we use JIRA here. So. Um, and so that's kind of how that whole process works, yeah. uh, for me at least. Also, as I, as I mentioned earlier, like our new focus will be on looking at the backlog to kind of see what features are needed for the, both the Persisting Universe and Ad Squadron 42. So we can focus on Star Citizen as a holistic product, right? If, if, if something is Persistent Universe only, it'll probably go back into the backlog, right, for, for the year, for the, mm -hmm. next, for the next time we review the backlog. Yeah. Uh, we'll build those features for the Persistent Universe as we get closer to, you know, rolling those features out and rolling out different uh, patches for the person's mm -hmm. universe. Yeah. So basically, you know, if, if Squadron 42 uh, needs something that is also beneficial for the PU, those things will get prioritized higher than yeah. something that's only beneficial for the PU. You yeah. know, so. uh, here's a question from Locke Ostry. I'm sure I pronounced that poorly. <laughs> um, how do you plan on building out the persistent universe? Are you planning on prioritizing the Stanton system and then work out from there? Or are you planning to finish up building out systems that already have content for them for things like Squadron 42? Or is there no real plan set for building out the PU at this time? Yeah, our, uh, I would say our midterm plan um, is to flesh out an entire system. Uh, so almost like a, a vertical slice of what uh, a system in the PU entails. So. Yeah, well, I think we'll be focusing mostly on the Stanton system for the foreseeable future, getting it to a gold standard quality. Um, you know, we're focusing on the four landing zones in Stanton, uh, our Corp, uh, our Corp's Area 18, Hurston, Microtech, and uh, Crusader. So getting all those landing zones fleshed out, um, making it so where you can actually visit those landing zones. So we'll be working with other teams across the project. Um, who are fleshing out the, the space portion, like the spaces in between the landing zones, starting with uh, Crusader and 2.0. Um, so you know, basically getting a, a gold standard system is going to be our, our immediate kind of near to the midterm priority. Yeah. Uh, and then when, I remember when I, when I first joined the team uh, a little over a year ago now, uh, the idea was kind of to, to be designing the first five star systems. Uh, but what we did not know at that point was how long does it take us to make a single star system, yeah. uh, or even a single landing zone, right? So over the course of the year, we've, we've really fleshed out a single landing zone. We've uh, done most of the work needed for a second landing zone. Um, and we've you know, just recently added different points of interest around the Stanton star system itself. So this is teaching us how long it's going to take us to do it. Uh, even though I would say we're not 100% complete with the landing zone yet, once we have that, it'll give us an idea of how much more we need to do, right? Yeah. So we've shifted our focus from instead of the first five complete star systems to like the first five landing zones, mm -hmm. right? So we, we currently have four landing zones in Stanton. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
th those are landing zones, right? And mm -hmm. not like I'm going out to a space station to make a quick repair and then getting back on. That's not really a landing zone. That's a, like a mission, right? So we're adding those as well. Mm -hmm. So this tells us what we need to do. Um, then from here, we'll be able to kind of move on to the next one was Nix, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Which is the Levski landing zone, mm -hmm. a much less populated system. Um, but that's going to need a lot of activity in it as well, right? Because you don't want like a single star system with one landing zone and that's it, right? How are those going to work out? So this yeah. will tell us kind of what a medium-sized system takes to build, what a sm very small system takes to build, mm -hmm. and then we can look at our processes and see how we need to tweak those processes and see how we can go forward with making a lot of content because that's what we need to yeah, do. Yeah. It'll give us m actual metrics, which is something that we don't have uh, for some of the areas of our project. So yeah. once we get those metrics, we can actually calculate, okay, we know this takes this long. Uh, if we want 20 systems by this time, uh, we know it'll take this long for us to make. And that'll give us information as like, do we need to ramp up more resources or outsource a little bit more? Um, and how yeah. can we make changes to the system to make it yeah. better or faster yeah. or yeah. You know, more down. procedural <laughs> or what have you? Yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is from Zeshio. Do you have different team members who are really excited to work on certain parts of Star Citizen that aren't in the pipeline yet? For example, maybe a team member is dying to work on mineable asteroid fields, but the work isn't there yet. Uh, do you have any examples of what uh, team members are excited to work on as we progress into 2.0 and beyond? Well, I, I you know, this, this is kind of already in the pipeline, it's in pre-production phase, but I know Mark Skelton is super excited to get his hands on the uh, the, um, the additional landing zones for, for Stanton, so Hurston, Microtech, and Crusader. Uh, you know, we've got one landing zone out there, we've got uh, another one almost almost uh, finished in, in Nix, and, and so moving on to these, uh, these, next, these next three, there's lots of opportunity to, to create uh, new things and, and uh, new aesthetics that we haven't seen yet in Star Citizen. Uh, you know, Crusader, or uh, Microtech's kind of a cold, you know, snowy planet. Um, Crusader's kind of a Bespin, kind of cloud city cloud type. Cloud city. Cloud city. And, uh, and then Hurston's like a refinery type, type atmosphere. So. Um, I know as an art director, that's a, that, that's a lot of things to look forward to. Um, we've already kind of, we're already in pre-production phase there. As we enter white box phase, we'll get some of those um, white boxes back, which is basically just a designer taking these uh, 3D objects and building out a space, a uh, rudimentary kind of space. Um, we'll get that back and then Mark Scott will, will put our concept artists to work and doing paint overs to, to actually, what is the space actually going to look like? And that's really exciting for him, I know. Yeah. So uh, my, I myself am excited to see the uh, the first uh, iteration of character customization because I'm I'm one of those guys who will spend hours just customizing my character and, and making them just perfect and uh, before I even start the game. So I, I'm excited I, about that. I don't even want to talk about how much time I spent trying to make my Fallout 4 character <laughs> look like Pam Poovey last night. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, it's a little embarrassing. Yeah. It's also embarrassing that I failed. I didn't really get oh, that. Oh, yeah, that's a bummer. Um, I also, I just want to mention that this, this might seem out of character for me because I'm one of the leads on the kind of the first person gameplay, but let me just put this out there. I'm most excited for the opportunity to work on game systems that don't involve combat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way you interact with mining uh, or the way you can uh, be, as Todd Pappy calls it, a uh, space trucker, right? Where you really, you don't need to shoot anybody at all uh, and to kind of make your way through the universe mm -hmm. and, and earn a living, like that's interesting to me. Yeah. Um, when I see people play, you know, some of the other games, especially some of the MMOs that, and try to do it like as a complete pacifist and the links that they have to go to to, um, yeah. to kind of earn that as an achievement for themselves, we're making a sandbox and that just really kind of geeks me out, the fact that we're making this sandbox for people to play in, and you, you don't have to kill anybody if you don't want to. Yeah. I'm, really, cool. I'm really looking forward to seeing how that shakes out. Yeah, not a lot of games kind of reward the pacifist lifestyle, <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of nice. Cool, I got, I got another question here from Locke Austri, uh, which makes him MVP for this uh, tent for the producers outside. It does, that's right. Um, congratulations on your victory and your bragging rights, sir. There are no other prizes. No other prizes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, here's the question. In the last monthly, rep monthly report, it was said that Cassava Outlet was wrapping up in order to get ready for the shopping release. Does this mean the persistence update, or at least parts of it, uh, has already been folded into 1.3 or 2.0? Or is persistence and shopping now part of the same release? So I'll take that one. Uh, persistence in the traditional sense of the, wor of the word is not folded into 1.3, which is live, or 2.0. Uh, in any kind of meaningful player-facing way. 
Um, though we are working, as we speak, on kind of the back end required to support persistence, player persistence. Uh, that being said, uh, our partners at Behavior and, and at Turbulent are working on some really clever things uh, that allow us to be able to kind of customize our character and have that state stick when you're going from one map type to, a, to another map type. Um, we're a ways off from tr having traditional persistence, and, and by that I mean like an inventory system that allows you to pick up an item, drop an item, sell an item, trade an item with a friend, uh, and have that thing, and then have it persist between play sessions. So like if you log out of the session, log mm -hmm. back in, uh, we're gonna fake it right now, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna have real persistence coming up. Um, I'm gonna go with the soon TM. <laughs> um, I think that was the last question, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and last thing I'll, I'll add to that is that, um, you know, the uh, persistence, as with everything that we, that we put out, we, we have um, iterations, right? Yeah. So, like, we'll have the first iteration go out to you guys, um, you know, that, that, and then the, as we kind of release, you know, um, 2.1 and 2.2, uh, we'll put in a more kind of functionality surrounding persistence and that kind of thing. So we'll have like hanger storage somewhere in there, you know, actually being able to buy something and send it back to your hanger. Um, you know, potentially even, uh, you know, as you, as you have clothing in Cassava Outlet or something, like picking clothing and then uh, being able to kind of persist that across uh, play sessions as well. So it's, it's an iterative process as, with, as it is with everything. So, uh, so just be patient and you'll get it in due yep. time. So uh, thank you all very much for joining us for yeah. this very Texas edition of, of 10 for the Producers. Whoop. I forgot <laughs> to wear my cowboy hat. Oh, Man, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so Jake, mm -hmm. thank the backers and subscribers for making this possible. Thank you so much. Good job. Thanks, guys. <laughs>